A reading from the book of Hebrews. <laughs> okay. Hear these words. Therefore, my friends, since we have confidence to enter the sanctuary by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that He opened for us through the curtain, that is, through His flesh, and since we have the great priest over the house of God, let us approach with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience, and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who has promised is faithful. And let us consider how to provoke one another to love and good deeds, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. For if we willfully persist in sin after having received the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a fearful prospect of judgment and a fury of fire that will consume the adversaries. Anyone who has violated the law of Moses dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. How much worse punishment do you think will be deserved by those who have spurned the Son of God, profaned the blood of the covenant by which they were sanctified, and outraged the Spirit of grace? For we know the one who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge His people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. But, recall those earlier days when after you had been enlightened, you endured a hard struggle with sufferings, sometimes being publicly exposed to abuse, to abuse and persecution, and sometimes being partners with those so treated. For you had compassion for those who were in prison, and you cheerfully accepted the plundering of your possessions, knowing that you yourselves possessed something better and more lasting. Do not, therefore, abandon that confidence of yours. It brings a great reward. For you need endurance, so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what was promised. For yet in a very little while, the one who is coming will come and will not delay, but my righteous one will live by faith. My soul takes no pleasure in anyone who shrinks back. But we are not among those who shrink back and are so lost, but among those who have faith and are so saved. For the Word of God in Scripture, for the Word of God among us, and for the Word of God within us. Thanks be to you, God. Well, this past week, America said bon voyage to someone who is considered by some to be America's pastor, Mr. John Stewart, the longtime host of Comedy Central's The Daily Show. It wasn't so much bon voyage, as the hashtag indicated this week, as Jean Voyage. <laughs> Clever, even still. It just so happens that after over the last 17 years, The Daily Show with Jon Stewart, who, who watches The Daily Show? About half. They have built a well-informed news audience, though you should know that it has been called the most trusted name in fake news. <laughs> They've connected with younger generations who are tired and uninspired by the politicizing of religion and the religionizing of politics in America. Through disarming humor and calling out hot air and hypocrisy, speaking to the issues of our time with a healthy dose of satire and truth-telling irreverence. The Daily Show's audience happened to be those who someone this week said, those people who are perfectly aligned with those absent from many churches. More on this in just a moment. Afterchurch.com had this to say about Jon Stewart. Jon Stewart has been one of the most regular and consistent provocateurs of moral thinking on contemporary topics with a level of thoughtfulness, complexity, and sincerity absent in much preaching today. 
Well, there it is. <laughs> Thoughtfulness, complexity, sincerity. You don't have to believe that John Stewart is America's pastor to see that this was the way he delivered the news. And it's a pretty doggone good way to describe how the pastor in Hebrews delivers the good news, too. If it is thoughtfulness and complexity that you're looking for, Hebrews has it. If you've been around for the last couple of weeks, you may recall that the last three and a half chapters of Hebrews has been kind of one long preacherly monologue about the meaning of Jesus' sacrifice and his identity as a high priest. We have been led through a theological gauntlet of who Christ is from the salvation of human beings by the writer of Hebrews who I think really does have a scholar's mind and a pastor's heart. And we've heard it all these last 11 or so Sundays. And now today's text turns our attention to more practical matters. So everyone can just say, thank goodness. <laughs> so we start with some questions like, what do we do about what we have heard? I mean, think about being a first-time listener to the longest sermon you'll ever find in the New Testament. That's Hebrews, in case you were wondering. And hearing this, therefore, my friends, Hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who has promised is faithful. And let us consider how to provoke one another to love and good deeds, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another. I'll stop right there and say, if you want a good working definition for the gospel, here it is, right here in Hebrews, something like, be cheerleaders for one another to love and good deeds. Worship together and don't neglect it like so many are doing. This is first century, not the 21st century, by the way, that we're hearing this text. And encourage one another. In other words, it's time to say how all of the thoughtfulness and complexity that we have heard is now lived out with sincerity of heart and actions. Time to answer the question, what difference does any of this make in the way we live our lives? It's important to keep in mind that some stuff had hit the fan in the lives of these listeners. The preacher is reminding the people of their past, coaching them up, so to speak, about how confident and compassionate and steadfast amidst suffering that they have been. Here are the words again. Recall those earlier days when after you had been enlightened, you endured a hard struggle with sufferings, sometimes being publicly exposed to abuse and persecution, and sometimes being partners with those so treated. For you had compassion for those who were in prison, and you cheerfully accepted the plundering of your possessions, knowing that you yourselves possessed something better and more lasting. Now this is a picture of perseverance for those who endured pain in very public ways. This was no hypothetical or theoretical matter uh, either because apparently after they had been enlightened, in other words, after they had joined the Jesus movement of the early church, they went through a hard struggle with sufferings. They suffered violence, both verbal and physical. They were put in prison. And their empty homes, while they were in prison, were looted, were looted and burglarized. And now the preacher of Hebrews is reminding them of those early days in the faith when they were brave and bold and did not back down. A time when their hearts were not hardened by their hardships. A time when they risked losing their possessions because they possessed a reward that could never be taken away from them. They possessed something better and more lasting. But now, rather than having the kind of wholehearted faith that had inspired them to compassion for those who were in prison and cheerfully accepting the plundering of possessions and living with a confidence that would bring a great reward, 
They were now, according to Hebrews, giving up on the grace of God they had experienced. They had even stopped worshiping together. And not only did they stop going to church, even worse, they had stopped being the church. They, instead of being courageous and compassionate in their faith, had become cowardly and cold. And the preacher of Hebrews puts it hardest and harshest of all, chastising them for belittling the Son of God, for shaming and mistreating the spirit of grace they had known. And before he seems to slam the spiritual door in their faces, the preacher of Hebrews clenches his jaw and quotes Scripture to clench his point. Vengeance belongs to God. The Lord will judge His people. Ouch. That's harsh. But the congregation's once wholehearted faith now has a lot of holes in it. Shot through by sin and suffering and pain. And some of the pain that only God fully knows because it's not even fully spelled out here in the text for us. But the preacher is pleading with them to not reject the truth that they once knew. To not give up on being the church and rather than getting out of it, to rather put their whole hearts into it again. The teacher of preachers, Tom Long, uses what I think is a Colorado kind of analogy to says The preacher's congregation is like a group of imperiled rock climbers who are being pulled to safety by the rope of faith. Just as they are nearing the top of the rock face, they have decided that they are growing tired and they just might let go of the rope. No wonder the preacher screams out a warning, if you let go, there is no saving you. This text is really hard for me. I have to admit that I have sympathy for the congregation of Hebrews because, um, let's face it, they have been persecuted for their faith, first of all. And we don't really know what that's like in the United States as Christians. Some Christians suffer from what one writer this week called CPC, the Christian Persecution Complex. Those who would want to force their faith onto others and to use a political system to control the lives and behaviors of people who don't believe and live by the Bible. Those who believe that the Bible and not the Constitution should be the foundational document of our nation. Well, Protestant privilege dies hard. And just because our faith may not be as popular as it once was, does not mean that we are being persecuted for it. There is an infinite qualitative difference between real persecution and being disappointed that our religious beliefs don't get preferential treatment in our political democracy. The congregation in Hebrews knew what real persecution was about in some of the ways that Christians today around the globe are suffering real persecution. Author and former pastor, say former pastor, Benjamin Dixon, helps us get real about this when he says, in North Korea, Christians can be executed for gathering together for worship. In Iraq, Christians are prey for terrorist groups that kill anyone who does not bow down to their particular version of Islam. In February of 2015, 21 Coptic Christians were beheaded simply because they were Christian. Reports indicate that many of them called on the name of Jesus just before they were viciously murdered. Persecution watchdog group Open Doors has identified 50 of the most dangerous places in the world for Christianity in which believers suffer a range of tribulations from severe persecution to sparse persecution. The United States is not on the list. And even so, we may not be persecuted for our faith, like the congregation in Hebrews, or like Christians in all these other parts of the world today, but we are still full of conflict. If not on the outside, like the congregation in Hebrews, then certainly full of conflict on the inside. Inside of ourselves. Inside the church itself. 
To the point of it being hard to know sometimes whether to stay in it or just to get out of it. I think for many people today there is a why bother? So what? What difference does it make anyway? Kind of mentality about the church. I know some of you in this room struggle with it. We identify with those in the congregation in Hebrews who made it a habit to neglect to meet together. In other words, they ain't going to church. <laughs> and we understand how people might get tired in worship. This guy's droning on and on about this esoteric book of Hebrews. Where we get tired of worship and we lose focus. We can lose heart. We can lose interest. And if we happen to be burned out on going to church or, or being the church, like our spiritual ancestors in the book of Hebrews, then by shrinking back from church, we know that nobody's going to ask us to serve on a committee. Nobody's going to ask us to give money. Nobody's going to ask us to lead a small group. If we lounge in the sanctuary of Starbucks on Sunday morning or sip our dark roast and watch Sunday morning news shows, some Sunday mornings, I want to do that too. <laughs> this week I read an article by someone else who sympathizes with such things about church. She's trying to talk to the skeptics, the cynics, the critics, the duns, the nuns, and the professional BS callers. <laughs> she writes this, I want you to know I hear you. You're my people. I see every bit of the drama, the pettiness, the poor stewardship, the moral grandstanding, the lack of authenticity, and the love of tedious meeting having that defines westernized Christianity. I know it can be gross. I know. I know the music can be bad. I know that the utility bill is higher than the mission giving. I know that sometimes the coffee is cold and the styrofoam cups are killing us all. <laughs> I know that we are embarrassingly late to the party on marriage equality, <coughs> racial reconciliation, and women's rights. I know that trifold brochures don't really change the world. <coughs> that a Hallmark fluffy cloud care bear heaven is nothing to shake your whole life around. And that a cartoon devil with a pitchfork does not inspire spiritual growth. I know. You are right. And you're right about every bit of it. And I feel your pain, your boredom, your disdain. It's all justified. And yet, I am still here. And it appears that you and I are still here too. At least for now. Why is that? Why are you here? Why are you still here when so many are a hair width away from becoming one of the so-called duns? People with years of devotion to Christ and the church who have given up and are now done with it. The thing is, many of us have attachments to church life, me too. Because there are some things that make us feel safe and comfortable. And it might be about things like singing hymns or the feel of a sanctuary, or the smell of a potluck meal. That's my favorite. <laughs> or going to a bunch of meetings. Just kidding. But if we learn anything from Hebrews, such trappings do not make for a wholehearted faith. There must be something more. And the something more at least has to be about something called Transformation. The transformation of our relationships and ourselves. The deep-seated curiosity and hunger to learn more things like love your neighbor as yourself, feed my sheep, go and make disciples, follow me, pray for your enemies, give to the poor, take, eat, remember, I happen to believe with as much of my heart as I can that there is no other community than a church who can teach us these things. 
Not even The Daily Show. Not even Jon Stewart. Sure, maybe his text is politics, his rituals comedy, his vestments American media, but the gospel is an old and universal one. And it's something like, be honest, be kind, have faith, say thank you. That's a pretty good start. But the truth is that if we get those other things right, the feed my sheep, make disciples, follow me, give to the poor stuff, you know, then the world will be more peaceful, more compassionate. Truth and beauty and goodness and wisdom will rule the world. God knows. And Hebrews tells us so, that the church is not always living up to this. Sincerely and with our whole hearts. Being cheerleaders for one another to love and good deeds. Worshiping together and not neglecting it like so many are doing. And encouraging one another. Go figure. This is some of what it means to hold fast to the confession of our hope that keeps our hearts set on being all in. And if not all in, then at least bringing as much faith as we have and all the faith that we have to the community of grace that is you. To you being a powerful person of a wholehearted faith, of us being a church that is all in to compassion and encouragement and risking vulnerability and worshiping together to be transformed into the likeness of the one who is the image of the invisible God, according to Colossians M. I wonder today if you ask yourself a question or a couple. Can I feel that now is not the time to lose heart? What if now is the time for me to keep hope alive by putting my whole heart into something. Into a relationship with a spouse or a partner or our children or maybe your work or maybe the work of the church. Whatever the answer is to that, let us join together in saying yes to being wholehearted. In other words, as Brene Brown has researched and written about vulnerability, what she calls wholeheartedness, to increase our capacity to engage in our lives with authenticity, to cultivate courage and compassion, and to go for it with all of our hearts. Mark Twain once said, inside every person is a tragedy and a comedy and a masterpiece. And the church needs to be a big enough place to hold all of it. For people who are holding all of this in their hearts. And all the while holding fast to the confession of our hope that calls us in the direction of a love that will never let us go. And in the direction of a place where we can finally be at home within ourselves, at home with each other, and at home in the deep and abiding love of God. To say with our whole hearts in the words of the gospel song. Hear my cry, hear my call. Hold my hand lest I fall. Take my hand. Precious Lord, keep me home. 